Hello 12A, I hope you're well. Um, I hope that you've um, enjoyed reading The Great Gatsby so far. Um, if not, I apologise. <laughs> um, but we're going to go through the answers uh, together. As you develop these literary skills, um, interpretation, interpretive skills, hopefully um, sort of it increases your enjoyment of um, a reading and, and obviously development of your critical thinking. Um, Okay, so the first one uh, from the first two pages, so it says two pages, basically the first couple of pages, um, what words establish the motive, or as we discussed last time, the themes of The Great Gatsby? So the ones that I would look at is probably hope. Reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. So he uses hope quite a few times um, in the first couple of sentences. And hope's definitely a theme. Hope for what though? Um, as you go through the book, it might be hope for um, hope for love, uh, unrequited love, or hope for um, moving from one class to another, or hope for riches or experience or uh, righteous parties or forgiveness. Um, another word is righteous. Sorry, not righteous, riotous, uh, which is different. Um, so riotous excursion, so exciting, extravagant. Um, extravagant is definitely a theme that comes through here in a riot. And I know riot is just, just craziness. Letting the issues that occurred throughout the First World War, um, putting those aside, again, like I said last time, short dresses, flappy dresses, uh, different types of dancing, jazz is coming out. Um, another word that he uses a lot is privileged. Uh, so with excursion privileged glimpses. So he uses that quite a few times. And here throughout the book, you may actually see that there's a comparison between those that are privileged and those that are not. In fact, when he first talks about his father at the very beginning, he says, Whenever you feel like criticising anyone, he told me, just remember that all people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. So here we're looking at, a, um, I suppose, the level of privilege or advantage that one group might have over another. Another word he uses often is romantic and finally hostile, which kind of, I suppose, juxtapositions in a way. You don't think of a hostile romance, but, you know, it's maybe something that does exist. And we'll look at that a little bit more when we consider um, Tom and Daisy's relationship. Um, the five vocabulary words, um, I can't do that because uh, that's up to you. Um, so hopefully you've completed that. Um, what business does Nick Carraway go into and why? So Nick moves into the bond business. And the reason being, hopefully you've got this as well. Um, again, just make sure you've got your red pen out or make some changes um, and go back and have a look um, through the book to see where I'm getting these answers from. Where is it? Anyway, he goes into the bond business basically in the 1920s. There's a boom, a big boom that's happening, as we know what happens in 1929, but we don't know that yet. Um, so there's a big boom in the 1920s. So getting into the bond business is a way to sort of make um, some quick, if not easy, some quick money. And the story takes place in 1922. And who does Nick go to the country with um, in the, I think it's this page. Ah. Uh, so a young man in the office suggested taking a house together. So he doesn't really know this guy. They've just decided to take that house together. So it's just a young man from the office. Now it talks about the differences between West Egg and East Egg. Okay, so how do you get to West Egg Village, he asks helplessly. So the difference between West Egg well, it's the less fashionable of the two. So West Egg is really about, um, and it sets up the West and the East. I suppose it's similar when you think about um, the East and the West uh, from a, a global perspective that there are differences. In here, we're using it to contrast old money and new money. So new money is within West Egg. So this is where people that have worked really hard to get their money um, have uh, bought houses. However, East Egg is the old money. And you might find that the old money think they're more respectable. They didn't have to work for their money. It's probably come down from the ladies and the lords. Next asked to describe Tom Buchanan. 
So I find, um, have a look at this one, for instance, Tom Buchanan in riding clothes was standing with his legs apart on the front porch. So immediately he's got a bit of a Superman stance. So when you think about, when I was reading about Tom Buchanan, and I'm reading through this with you guys, um, definitely wealthy. He obviously, he lives in East Egg. Um, he seems quite condescending in the way that he speaks to people. He's loud and he's brash. Um, it's kind of like a big bull in the room. He seems quite arrogant. And he says, Tom says that he has a cruel body. He uses words like hard, hard mouth. Um, he was sturdy, straw-haired man of 30 and rather hard mouth with a supercilious manner. Supercilious, as we discussed, means um, I think I'm a little bit better than you. Dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Um, so it's quite, it's quite, a, quite a forceful person in a room, I suppose, takes up a lot of space in the room. So who are the two girls on the divan? And that's Jordan Baker. And we've got Daisy. And so Daisy Buchanan, married to Tom Buchanan, and Daisy is our connection to Nick. Uh, so Daisy is Nick's cousin. How does Daisy talk and why? I don't know if I can find these um, But I don't know where I found this answer. Um, okay, so basically Daisy speaks in quite exaggerated phrases. Oh, it's such a hot day. So everything's really elongated, exaggerated, very breathy. Um, it seems like she's thought about how she speaks and how she gets her point across. Um, she kind of reduces everything she says. So even when she says something really important, um, because of the way she speaks, it just seems like it's not as important. I feel when I read about her, I think maybe that's a way for her to protect herself. Um, keeping in mind that it's 1920s, uh, women probably don't have as much liberation as what they have now, um, and she's married to quite um, a, a, an oppressive type man. So maybe that's a way of holding on to her identity and keeping something close to her. Why does Tom's comment toward Nick involving Bond Man annoy him? Let's see if I can find that one. Well, basically, he says Bond Man. When you think about Tom, uh, Tom's old money and Nick is hoping to become new money. So he, he just makes comments about, oh, you're just the Bond Man. Um, it's way to degrade Nick. It's to belittle Nick. Um, and I think it definitely brings up that class issue. It's as if Tom kind of feels offended by people having to have employment in order to have money. So then it's asked you to read through um, some, uh, just a, a short excerpt um, and go through to the answers. So how does Nick feel about Jordan Baker? If you look, he goes, I enjoyed looking at her. She was a slender, small breasted girl with an erect carriage, which she accentuated by throwing her body backward at the shoulders like a young cadet. Um, my interpretation is that he's definitely physically attracted to her. Um, however, that he feels that maybe she's a bit discontented and might be a bit aloof, like she's uh, maybe not entirely engaged, uh, almost ethereal in a way. Um, I didn't get you to do number six to eight, but how does Jordan Baker feel about Nick? So you can see in, I can't remember, oh, here she is. Um, her son, her grey sun-strained eyes looked back at me with polite reciprocal curiosity out of wan, chiming, discontented face. So she's reciprocally curious. So while he's looking at her and interested, she's also looking at him and maybe a bit interested. Explain the metaphor in lines 16 to 17. So here uh, we've got that um, Tom is actually moves Nick uh, like a checker. Uh, into another square. So what would that imply? Tom's the one that's actually moved the person like a checker into another square. It's he's completely in control of that particular situation. And maybe it implies that Nick uh, feels controlled or dominated by him. 
because he's just, um, to use a different metaphor, he's just a pawn on the board, just being moved about um, at the whim of um, the, the person playing. The next one is more personal. So how would you describe Daisy? So looking at the first chapter, um, taking in all of that information, how would you personally describe Daisy? The difficulty for me, I've read this book, um, this will be my third time that I've read this book now. Um, so uh, it's hard to use just those first chapters, but when I tried to um, limit myself to that first chapter, I would have called her maybe like a sprite. A sprite is kind of like a little fairy uh, type of thing, uh, kind of here, but not here. Uh, hard to, you can't grasp onto them like a cloud. Um, well, you know, when you have a dream and you, you kind of remember it, the more that you remember, the more, the further it goes away. Um, so it seems that the author is implying that she might be a bit simple minded. Um, like, oh, you know, what do people make plans about? Uh, I'd suggest that she's definitely privileged, maybe somewhat spoiled and definitely aloof. Um, but again, that's up to you and your interpretation of uh, the information. So everybody interprets books differently. Um, some people love this book and love Daisy. Some people absolutely despise Daisy. I find Nick a bit annoying, um, but I definitely, I do like, when you meet him, um, I do like Gatsby. So how do Tom and Daisy feel about race? And why does Fitzgerald include this information? And what does it say about the context of society? Now, even though in, this, in the First World War, um, African-American people did actually fight, when they came home, they were reduced sort of back into menial jobs. Um, there was apartheid, I think, um, uh, still happening, especially in, in uh, the South areas of America. Um, so slavery was still going on as well. So this sets up a bit of context. And also, not only are we separated by class, but we're also separated by race. Tom specifically says that white people are superior. Uh, he's very adamant about that. And I think he kind of imply, uh, pushes Daisy to agree, but she's quite ambiguous. So she doesn't give a specific answer. So whether she thinks differently to him or whether she doesn't think about it all um, is a little bit different. What does Tom call Nick? So he calls Nick Nordic because um, Nick's reading about the rise of the coloured empire. Remember, we're coming into the Second World War. This book was written in 1925, so there are probably sort of some heightened uh, issues happening in particular coming out of Germany. Um, and also there was something that was called eugenics that were happening in America. So eugenics is when you, just, when you try and um, limit the genes or change the yeah, limit, but, but get, you know, the prettiest people to marry and, and procreate with the prettiest people. And um, if someone might have a disability, um, you would stop them from having children in order for that disability not to carry on through the genes. It's a terrible, horrifying thing, um, but it's something that was definitely happening in America, becoming quite popular, and that eventually went over to Germany. Um, and then we saw, obviously, what happened with the Nazis. So um, Tom calls Nick Nordic. Nick feels a bit frustrated about this um, because it's just making an overall judgment based on one book. So it's like Tom is, can only see people in one dimension, okay, through one, one eye, one perspective. Why does Daisy want her daughter to be a fool? And what does it reveal about Daisy? It's really, this is um, such a poignant and important uh, comment in the book. Um, it's, I always find it one of the most emotional. Um, so let's read it. I'm glad it's a girl and I hope she'll be a fool. It's the best thing a girl can be in this world. A beautiful little fool. It's also, she's almost being really cruel to herself. Um, but it's like that means if they're a fool, they're protected. They have less expectation and they can just accept everything for as it is, accept society for what it is, your life for what it is. Um, if you're a fool, it's kind of, you know, there's, there's no other choices or options. Uh, so it's a really, for me, I think it's a really sad comment. Um, and it, it, it shows that Daisy is a lot uh, more insightful than she tries to pretend. Uh, how does Tom feel about Jordan Baker? 
So Jordan doesn't like Tom and would like uh, Daisy to definitely get away from him. He's a horrible, horrible beast of a man. Uh, and everybody knows about his extracurricular activities. Um, however, Tom, because of his arrogance, can't actually see this, uh, nor can he see the subtleties of Jordan. Um, and he thinks that, uh, as he does with everybody else, he thinks that he can use her. Um, Nick discusses his engagement. He's not actually engaged. Uh, there seems to be a lot of commentary about um, you, you went out with that girl, that means that you're going to get married to her. And that was something that happened probably in the early 1920s. Um, but as we said, uh, moving out of the Second World War, society and people, um, men and women, they're trying to redefine themselves um, and by doing so, re redefining uh, society. Um, at the end of chapter one, the first chapter, um, we see uh, we see Gatsby kind of for the second time, um, and Nick comments so he thinks oh I could shout out to him and say hello you know he's within that distance but he sees this man staring off at that green light in the distance shaking. The interaction seems observed. Uh, there's a lot of dark water. There's trembling. So there isn't really an interaction except that Nick is observing or watching him, which is similar to what he's doing in the book. So we're almost doing a double. So we're seeing through his eyes and then seeing through his eyes, seeing through his eyes, which is interesting. And what this is, the, the literary term of this is actually called foreshadowing, which I'm sure that you all are aware of. Um, there's probably a different Chinese word for it, but it means giving us a hint about what's going to happen next in the book. And it gives a feeling of an ominous feeling of like, oh, something quite dramatic is going to occur. So what I'd like you guys to do today, um, I'm going to send you through chapter two. Um, so the questions for chapter two, but I also would like you to finish this section for the sentences about the theme. So now we've talked about all of these answers, I'd like you to go through and see where um, you found one, two, three, these three particular motives, dreams, wealth and possession. And I want you to have a look back at page seven. Here we go. Oh, I gave it to in a different document. Um, there's, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, basically the vocabulary words. Here we go. So the vocabulary words for here, um, I'd like to write a complete sentence for each of the six words. So now that we've actually seen them, I want you to write your own sentence for each of those six words. And then you're gonna move on to chapter two. And here we are, chapter two. Um, so I've kept this in the same, so you don't need to go from the last book. Hopefully this has been printed out for you. So you're gonna complete page 16, go through page 17, 18, and that's it. So nice and short for chapter two this week, and then we'll go through the answers next week. I am trying to give you um, about 45 minutes um, per week to actually, well, first of all, we go through this and then an extra 45 minutes to complete the answers um, after you read through the book. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, please send me a message uh, in terms of uh, the fee, uh, how we're running this session. If you want me to go a little bit slower, if you would like um, some written um, examples uh, of the answers that I've given today, um, if you don't agree with it, anything at all, um, I wanna try and make it as interesting as possible, but it is really important that we continue to develop our um, reading and interpretation skills. Thanks very much. Um, as always, available on WeChat um, or email. Um, have a good day and I will see you next class.